Hey everyone, welcome back to Courtroom Chronicles with the County Attorney. I'm Mike Pelton, the Public Information Officer here at the Pinal County Attorney's Office, and we have County Attorney Kent Volkmer uh, back here for Episode 3. And for those of you watching online, uh, we've upgraded our quote-unquote studio a little bit. We have some gold-plated uh, microphones. It's almost like a, 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 a half-hearted setup, I'd say. <laughs> oh, it looks beautiful. It looks very uh, official, very legal, very law office -y. Now today, for our uh, first case that we're going to talk about in this uh, in our new podcast room here, uh, it's a case that that we've been asked about uh, several times, uh, even still over the past couple of years. It was also um, featured in a documentary on Oxygen and their Snapped series, uh, and that's just because some of the facts of the case are. I don't know if incredible is the right way to put it. I mean, how how would you kind of describe this case? So look, Mike, most cases are crimes of opportunity. There are crimes of passion. There are crimes of people being under the influence. But there's this real small subset where there is just an incredible amount of premeditation. And the case that we're going to talk about is the single greatest amount of premeditation I've ever seen in a case. And we'll talk a little bit about how difficult that makes, you know, your job, you know, as prosecutors, as law enforcement that had to really uncover this. But this happened in uh, the city of Maricopa. So for those who don't know where that is, just southwest of Phoenix, uh, kind of set the scene for us here. And it's it's even in this neighborhood where the most stereotypical neighborhood, you know, nothing ever happens here. It's quiet, that sort of thing. So the, the town of Maricopa is oftentimes referred to as a bedroom community to the greater Phoenix metro area. Um, so what you have is you have a bunch of just middle class, hardworking individuals. There's a couple small retirement communities, but it's a pretty sleepy little burg. Um, fairly well to do, um, but, but not a lot of action, not a lot of violent crime coming out of that community. So uh, when this kind of came forward, it, it was sort of a shock to everybody. And it was the end of uh, 2016. Neighbors start to hear uh, either a single gunshot or multiple gunshots. That's correct. So uh, again, it, this is middle of the afternoon, sun shining. It's December. Um, but here in Arizona, it's usually still 50, maybe 60 degrees. But it's just a regular day uh, in, again, a sleepy kind of safe community. And they hear pop, pop, pop. Um, and the neighbors aren't sure what's going on. So they call 911 and they can't even say where it came from. They're just saying, look, we heard gunshots, what we think are gunshots. And they eventually find a, uh, you know, kind of a run of the mill house, garage doors open. Um, no one's really sure, like, I mean, is this, is this where the gunshots were? And it, it's really tough to tell where even the gunshots took place. Absolutely. So law enforcement, you know, has no idea what happened. This may have been fireworks that went off. This could have been kids doing dumb things. It could have been a million different things. So they went to one of the residences of somebody that called, and they were just kind of talking with them out front, and they looked around. And uh, when you look in this neighborhood, it's one of those neighborhoods where a lot of the homes are cookie cutters, so they look very similar. Everybody's you know, driveways are clean, everybody's front yard's manicured, um, and everybody's garage doors are shut, except for one. Uh, they look over and kind of across the street, a couple houses down, a garage door is open. And law enforcement just innocently asked the neighbor, is, is that usual? Um, and the neighbor said, no, no, that's not normally the way um, that garage door house or garage door looks or how the house looks. And that was really where their attention was first drawn to the residents. And they ultimately find uh, who will be the victim in, uh, I think it's the driver's seat. That is correct. So as they walk up, um, again, they have no idea what they're looking for. They walk up, they see that there is a vehicle that is parked in the garage. Um, and as they begin approaching the vehicle, they notice what appear to be um, gunshot holes in the rear windshield. It's unclear at this point exactly uh, who the suspect or suspects are. I think a friend comes to the scene and kind of helps law enforcement out, if I'm remembering correctly. That's correct. So again, they don't even know who the victim is at this point. But as they approach, what they see is they see um, a person who's been shot, um, clearly deceased, sitting in the front seat. Uh, and at this point, they know they now have a homicide on their hands. Uh, they don't have any other information, so they start doing what they're supposed to do. And they're, they're um, sort of canvassing the scene and talking with neighbors. And how do they hone in on, I, I won't give the name yet, but how do they hone in on a potential suspect or suspects? Uh, you know, the, the victim in this case, Michael, um, the neighbors knew him. Um, everybody had nothing but great things to say about him. Wonderful guy, great neighbor, never causes any issues. So they're saying, hey, does, does he have any enemies? Do you know anybody that might not like him, that may want, you know, want to do him harm? And everybody's like, no, no, everybody loves Michael. And then suddenly uh, one of the friends goes, oh, wait a second. 
um, he's got a crazy ex-girlfriend. Uh, and that is the first sort of clue or first tip that law enforcement really gets. And before we even move ahead, I forgot to mention, he was on that. He, he was on the phone with his sister when the, the shooting took place. I don't know that that really gave any context as to who the shooter was, but I think it was a family member who was actually on the phone with him when this happened. That's absolutely accurate. He is talking with his sister, um, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but he's coming back from a doctor's appointment, and he was just chatting with his sister who lived back east, kind of updating her on what happened, how things are going. They're just communicating. He pulls into his house, and suddenly there's nothing. She hears nothing on the other end. The phone doesn't hang up, um, but he's no longer talking to her. So it, it, law enforcement is kind of pointed in the direction of uh, this ex-girlfriend. So now you have to run down, oh, okay, well, it seems simple enough. Like, is there, you know, is there video? I mean, we, we'll, we'll easily be able to figure out if it's her or not. I mean, it wasn't uh, quite that easy. <laughs> no, it certainly wasn't. Um, and, and they thought it would be easy at first because uh, as they were starting to, to look at the scene and taking a step back, they noticed that um, Michael's house actually had a video camera. And they said, oh, my gosh, we, we probably have, you know, this on recording. Um, so they go get a copy, and it was a little bit difficult, but they were able to work through it, and they were able to actually view the uh, the video camera, the surveillance camera. Now, unfortunately, the surveillance camera is not um, pointing right at his front door. Instead, it's sort of on the um, other side of a garage, so it's got kind of an obscured view. But as they watch and they go back to the, the rough time uh, that they think it occurred, and they can figure that out from the 911 calls, and they're like, okay, let's go back, you know, maybe 10 minutes before that. Uh, and what they see is they see a a figure that has a black hooded sweatshirt on, um, the hood kind of pulled over their head, and, and I would describe them as sort of prancing. And there's something in their hand, they sort of prance, they come out of scene, not for very long, just a, you know less than a minute, then all of a sudden you see them dart off and they run off screen. Uh, and then there's nothing. There's no vehicles, there's no traffic for a little while. And then after a period of time, you see a just a white minivan that drives by that looks like any other minivan you'd see in a sort of suburban community like this. And the suspect, or the presumed suspect, uh, Catherine Sinkovich is uh, her name, uh, doesn't have a white minivan. No. So after they get the the sort of suggestion, hey, the only person that might have something against him is, is you know, his former girlfriend, uh, they start researching and, and they find out, if I remember correctly, I think she had like a small blue sedan that she drove, not even close to being a white minivan. So initially they sort of said, well, don't think it's her. So they were sort of at square one again. So before we keep going on and how many kind of roadblocks there were in this case, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, well, why would the ex-girlfriend want to harm this this nice guy, Michael? That's probably what makes this case so difficult for everyone. Um, so there, there's a little bit of backstory there. And the backstory is this. Michael had been the repeated victim of both physical and emotional uh, domestic violence and abuse perpetrated by Catherine. Um, you know, her behavior w was outrageous. Uh, her, his family would describe it as crazy. And uh, at some point, he just, he had enough. He broke up with her and said, I, I want nothing to do with you. Then she comes back to him and says, uh, well, I'm pregnant. Uh, again, thinking about it, and he, Michael wanted nothing initially to do with her. Going back, thinking about all the abuse, all the craziness that ensued, he wanted to just keep keep her away. And then it sort of weighs on Michael. And, and, you know, we get this from his family members. We get this from his friends where, you know, he's watching her Facebook and social media accounts and he, he sees, you know, her belly growing. He sees those things growing, going, and he starts doing the math and he says, oh my gosh, I really do think this, this is my child. So well before she gives birth, um, he reaches back out to her and says, look, I, I don't want to have a relationship with you. We're done. Um, but I'm going to be there for my child. Like, this is my first child. I have no other children, and I'm going to be a father for my child. And th she didn't necessarily want that. No. Uh, she then said, this isn't your child. I just lied to you back then. I, I just wanted to get, get you back. This can't. And she gave him some kind of funky date and some crazy math saying, not possible, could not be your child. Um, but he knew. So back to this investigation, they start running down where Catherine was. She doesn't have the white minivan, right? Um, okay, well, she was at work that day during the time that this homicide occurred. Correct. And just to be overly sure, uh, they actually went to her employer. They discovered that, much like we have, uh, they have badges. Swipe badges in, swipe badges out. 
Um, so they pulled the swipes, and they looked, and that day, Catherine swiped in, and Catherine did not swipe out until 5 p.m., and this, this murder occurs at roughly 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So again, all indicia is that it, it was not her because she was at work during the time in question. So she doesn't have the white minivan. She's uh, Badge swipes will show that she was at work during the time of this homicide. Uh, what was Michael doing just before the homicide? So getting back to what we were talking about just a little bit ago, um, Michael said, no, this is my child. And when um, Catherine gave birth to the child, Michael established a paternity case. And he went to the court and said, look, this is my child. And she again said, it's not his child. And the court ordered them to take a paternity test. Uh, So what happened is the court said, look, Catherine, you need to go um, get a DNA swab of your child, which is just a little Q-tip. Um, of the inside of the cheek. You need to pick the facility. You need to take your child there. And then you need to tell Michael um, what facility it is so he can go there and he can give his DNA sample as well and they can do a DNA comparison. Uh, And in this case, Michael, shortly before uh, he passed, he was coming back from giving that DNA sample at the um, paternity clinic. I don't know what you feel about coincidences. I know uh, coincidences don't make someone guilty, but I've, I've got to imagine law that's raising kind of the hair on law enforcement's back going, hey, this guy just got killed coming home from taking a paternity test. Uh, something seems off there. So again, you have to look at it from a law enforcement perspective. Um, we've got a really short kind of time frame when a case comes in to start making really quick decisions. So when they look initially, they've got a potential suspect in Catherine. So they look and say, okay, white van. She doesn't drive a white van. She has a what looks to be a rock-solid alibi, so they sort of initially scratch her off, and they are like, okay, we're back at square one. But then they uncover this information, and this information says, wait, we need to take a deeper look at Catherine and, and make sure that what she's saying is there because they had no other leads. So they start – she worked in uh, – correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Tempe or somewhere um, right around the center of the valley. Um, they start looking at her work, and – uh, yeah, her badge said she was there, but I, I think the police discover that um, her badge might have been sitting there, but but she wasn't? Correct. Um, so, you know, through a, a number of very good investigative hunches and following up on those hunches, law enforcement says, hey, I know that there's a badge, but but let's actually look at camera footage. You know, is there any camera footage? So they go and they meet with the head of security there. And uh, sure enough, they, they ultimately end up getting camera footage of Ms. Sinkovich walking out. Um, and when they sync it up with her badge swipe, and they said, well, wait a second, we see her physically walking out. We don't see the badge, but she did swipe a badge. Uh, and when they saw that she swiped a badge, they said, well, we know exactly what time this badge was swiped. So whose badge did she actually swipe? And they went back and, and ended up discovering whose badge she swiped. And uh, whose car did she swipe? <laughs> <laughs> One in the same. So it turns out that she actually took the badge from sort of her cubicle mate um, when her cubicle mate wasn't paying attention, took her badge, and actually took her cubicle mate's car keys as well. Law enforcement was able to actually locate that vehicle, I think, and then determine who the right owner was. And, okay, this is the car. It's not Catherine's car, but we found it. Correct. And shock of all shocks, it ends up being a white minivan the same make and model as is seen in the video driving shortly after Michael's death. And the one thing, uh, presumably, she didn't think about, because this seems really well thought out, the one thing I don't think she thought about was uh, maybe the cell phone. Well, she kind of did and she kind of didn't, because she did have her cell phone on her, but she only got so far out of sort of Tempe proper in the kind of Chandler area when suddenly her cell phone goes dark. It's turned completely off. So it's pinging, 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 pinging. And then it's complete and utter radio silence. And then for about the next hour or hour and 15 minutes, there is absolutely no pinging on the cell phone. It appears to be completely turned off. And then after that hour, hour and 15 minutes, suddenly it turns right back on at roughly the same place that it turned off. What was, if you remember, what was her explanation or her, when presented with, hey, well, you're a suspect in you know, Michael's homicide, what was her story, so to speak? What I remember most is she was just kind of indignant about it. Um, she had nothing to do with it. It's a tragedy. Uh, you know, you can look her up. You can you can check her out. She was at work the whole time. I mean, she had an excuse for everything and really looked fairly 
cool as she is responding to law enforcement and, until, frankly, she started crying. Now, this case ultimately went to trial. What was the verdict? Uh, she was found guilty of premeditated first-degree murder. Anecdotal, I'm not expecting stats here, but um, it's rare for women to be suspects in a f- you know, first-degree homicide, isn't it? Certainly, yes. I, I would say probably in our county, probably nine to one. For every 10 homicides, maybe one would be a female. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there was no other uh, established motive or anything other than she killed Michael because he wanted to be a dad in his kid's life. That's exactly why she killed him. And how do you react to that? I mean, I I just, you have a, a guy who wants to do what society expects of him, and that's to step up and be a father, to be a provider, to be a mentor, to be somebody that's in a child's life, to give that child the ability to be successful. I mean, that's what everybody wants from every father in this world. And this guy tried to stand up, and because he tried to stand up and be that father, Catherine Sinkovich took his life. And one of the most chilling parts of this case, I think, to me, and for those watching online, we'll, we'll have the video on over this, but that's, going back to that surveillance video in the moments that Michael was killed, uh, from the side of his home, you see you know, who we now know as Catherine kind of running, running up. Um, you know, her face is covered, but running up. She has something in her hands that looks like a pile of paperwork. I know it was never definitively proved what, what she was holding, but what is the thinking that was uh, that, that, what was that paperwork, do you think? The detectives were fairly confident that it was actually the paternity paperwork. The court's order to go get the paternity test and all of the paperwork from the doctor's office that day. Uh, it's still... It, uh, chilling. Certainly. And when you look at the totality of this case, she tried to put up a lot of roadblocks. I mean, talk about the job that that law enforcement did in this case, because it's one thing to think, hey, Catherine is the suspect in this murder. It's another thing to actually prove it in court or disprove all the roadblocks she put up. I cannot say enough great things about law enforcement in this case. You know, we talked about just a little bit ago, her phone turned off for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. So what law enforcement do? They actually got in a vehicle and they drove at that time of the day from that point to Mr. Uh, Agerter's house, Agerter's house, um, sat there for a period of time and then drove back during that same time frame to establish that, yes, in fact, that is about the exact amount of time needed to go, lie and wait for five or so minutes until the person gets there and then return. Uh, they did all of the follow-up. They, they didn't just stop at the swipe card. They went and got the video. They interviewed um, everybody that was involved with it. I mean, they chased down every loose end. I um, mean, it was only because of that just phenomenal police work that we were able to hold her accountable, bring Michael's murder to justice, and, and really give his family that that peace of mind that his murderer is being held accountable. And my last question here, just you called this like the, the single greatest case of premeditation you've seen. It may be a dumb question, but looking back on it now, what, why do you think that that is? So, I mean, just think about what went through the planning here. So she set up a doctor's appointment um, and she knew where he was going to be and she knew where he was going to come from there. So in the meantime, she that day went to work like she would any other day. She swiped her badge like she would any other day. When her cubicle mate wasn't paying attention, she swiped her cubicle mate's card and swiped her cubicle mate's um, car keys. She was smart enough to take her own card off so it didn't accidentally trigger something when she left. She drove a completely different vehicle. She waited, she lied in wait, but again, remember with her phone, she got to a point, turned her phone off, and the waited she got back to that same point. Point. When she got back, she parked the van as if nothing was there. She went back into her office, like her cubicle, like she normally would. She very covertly slipped the, um, you know, the badge and the keys back. So again, her cubicle mate had no idea, and she finished the rest of her day like it was nothing. She went and committed a cold and calculated and pre-planned murder, and she had all the details from the beginning to the end, and when law enforcement started asking her questions, she had a defense or an excuse for every single thing. I mean, she had planned this for who knows how long, and she executed the plan, quite frankly, very, very well, but for law enforcement, but for them following every lead and not easily being uh, turned away, um, she would have got away with this. Yeah, and, and kudos to law enforcement. And we'll just kind of end it where we kind of started it. You know, Michael, just everyone said he was such a, a great guy, um, really great human being. And, you know, thoughts go out to, to all of his family and friends. The one, uh, I guess, kind of redeeming factor is um, their child is doing well. 
the child is healthy and the child is in Michael's family. So that child is being raised in a loving home. Um, they're being told how great of a, a guy their dad was, and they're doing everything in their power to, to make sure that he has as normal and as a, an enjoyable childhood as possible, given the circumstances. Sure, absolutely. At least a little bit of a silver lining in what is a tragic and, and horrible, horrible instance. And we really just bring this up because even though this case ended a few years ago, we still get asked about it. And, and as mentioned, it was even featured on a, a documentary. So a very, uh, because of the circumstances we laid out, a very uh, unusual, uh, tragic, but uh, unusual set of circumstances. And I uh, want to thank uh, all of you watching online or listening in your car uh, for uh, taking time out of your day to listen to this. And we'll see you next time on Courtroom Chronicles with the County Attorney.